Uh, thank you also everybody from home uh, and for joining me in my home office here. Today what we're going to do is we're going to talk about restoring lymphatic function and what we mean by uh, lymphatic function is shown on your screen with the lymphatic motion on the uh, medial knee area as well as uh, in the arm. So you see these straight lymphatic vessels that are pumping lymph so um, we have immune health. Now, before I get started, um, what I'd like to do is just to pull everybody to figure out what your, your primary focus is. And this way, I'm going to be able to uh, direct the, the discussion or direct the presentation uh, more along to the lines of, of, of the audience. So I see you guys are putting this all together. And um, it's good. So we have uh, a number of lymphedema therapy uh, uh, persons, persons that are focused on lymphedema therapy, some vascular, some wound. Um, let me share those results with you. So you, you, we, we see what our, our, our peer group is here, and you see that we have a lot of lymphedema therapy uh, folks. I think uh, the, the talk will cover all these areas, but at least it'll allow me how to um, uh, direct the presentation um, to the majority of, of, of you. Um, let me see how we can move forward. Oh, here we go. Um, so first of all, I just want to uh, reiterate or, that this is a, a lymphatic talk um, and being part of the lymphatics means, you know, you're really talking about the immune system. And we are not going to talk about COVID-19, although it's important that you realize that, you know, the people that are most susceptible to the adverse events of COVID-19 are those that uh, have um, you know impaired lymphatics or impaired immune system they have chronic conditions now the guidelines for the lymphatic disease community it is is uh, for caution for those with congenital central lymphatic anomalies or defects um, but you might as you go through this presentation you might be thinking to yourself about all those people with um, lymphatic dysfunction that impair that as a result of the function of what why why the lymphatics work is to maintain um, uh, immunity today what we'll be doing is describing the lymphatics through the use of this near infrared technology that uh, Brooke had alerted alluded to um, we're going to be showing you these images that were conducted under an IRB and FDA approval. It's an off-label administration of indocine green. The technology is not yet available um, for use, hopefully soon. The studies that we'll be presenting were funded by the Longeberger Foundation, um, the American Cancer Institute, National Institutes Health, um, the Cancer Prevention um, Research Institute of Texas, and uh, tactile medical funded some of the studies as well as uh, uh, NASA through a cooperative agreement. And as a way of disclosure, um, uh, uh, my team and I have um, financial interests in royalty and equity as interests associated with uh, commercializing the, the technology. So to give you an idea of what we're going to talk about in the next about 30 minutes is we're going to, first of all, just to introduce the lymphatics. And I want to really emphasize the role of the lymphatics in mediating immune responses. And then what I'm going to do is talk about breast cancer lymphedema, head and neck lymphedema that would be of interest um, for the uh, lymphedema therapists that are on board, as well as the oncology and the radiation oncology folks. And then uh, we'll, we'll end with a discussion on peripheral vascular disease. It's a new evolving area where the wound of the vascular folks um, will be interested in. But hopefully this, the whole, uh, the whole presentation will st strike some interest for all of you uh, throughout the whole uh, presentation. So let's just uh, get started here. Um, you know, the lymphatics is not a circulatory system, it's a unidirectional system. And that the lymphatics start with the initial lymphatics. This is like the, the immature lymphatic capillaries that don't have a basement membrane. And what they do is they basically allow entrance of excess fluid and immune cells into the lymphatics. From there, sorry, I'm having problems with my point. There we go. From, from these initial lymphatics, these initial lymphatics surround every organ. They're underneath the epidermis. From there, um, uh, excess fluid and immune cells will be transited through collecting and conducting vessels. And these conducting vessels consist of lymph angions. These are segments that are bounded by valves and have smooth muscles, and they actually pump the lymph, oftentimes against gravity. And it pumps that lymph up to the subclavian vein where um, lymph empties into the blood vasculature. 
Um, now, we don't really understand what this, what governs this lymphangion activity. And we'll be showing you some of the images of this lymphangion activity. We think it's associated with the autonomic nervous system. But we know that this lymphangion activity it is impaired in, in lymphatic dysfunction. And, and whenever we have um, impairment of the lymphatics, either anatomically or functionally, we just don't have that return of this excess fluid and the immune cells to the blood vascular system. Now, you know, in the past um, a few years, less than, less than a decade ago, about a decade ago, the lymphatics have gotten a lot of attention because our idea of the physiology of the, uh, the, the, the capillary filtration and the blood vascular system has gone a radical, uh, dramatic change. Um, in, the way we were all taught about the microcirculation uh, arises from Starling's Law of 1896. And it really taught us that the nutrients um, from the arterial side, that's the oxygen and the nutrients for cell survival, they were delivered to the interstitium by this capillary filtrate. And the oxygen was used, uh, nutrients were used, metabolic waste products were produced. And it was always thought that that fluid would be reabsorbed into the venous side so that the macromolecules, the waste products would go back to the blood vasculature for processing by the liver. But in 2010, we found out that there was a glycocalyx that lined the lumen of the, of the vasculature. And this glycocalyx actually prevents um, the reabsorption of fluid and reabsorption of macromolecules. And so it's now become, um, you know, widely accepted that the lymphatics are responsible for the uptake of all these waste products, uh, of the body's waste products, and that excess fluid. And it's responsible for returning it to the blood vascular system, not the venous, but the lymphatics. And so we, we actually have like 12 liters per day of fluid that's returned by the lymphatic system. That's what's, what's been ex uh, estimated. So this lymphatic system is really important. Um, you can't have cardiovascular health without a lymphovascular health. And uh, we, it's probably, the lymphatic system has probably escaped attention because we haven't had a means to routinely image it. Our team has been developing this near-infrared for us, this lymphatic imaging technique. It uses a off-label administration of endocytin green, which has been used for about 50, 60 years. We put a trace dose right underneath the, the skin, um, and I'll show you that in a moment. Um, this dye is actually fluorescent. It fluoresces in the near-infrared range. So what we do is we take a laser diode, much like your grocery store scanner, and we illuminate the surfaces of tissues. That light will penetrate through several centimeters of tissues, excite the dye that's located in the lymphatic vessels, and that dye will fluoresce. And what we've done is we've, uh, we're, we've developed a system that will sensitively detect that fluorescence. It turns out that the, the cameras, systems that are in your iPhone and, and, and in the computer screen that you're seeing, they're all based upon silicon. It's not very sensitive. So what we've actually done is we actually, after the first Gulf War, we contacted the Army and we basically got them to help us develop a technology whereby uh, we take these night goggle technologies that look at the near-infrared signature and we adapt them onto our silicon detectors. And that allows us to accu accurately and very sensitively detect um, the syndocyanin green and trace doses as deep as three to four centimeters with really rapid imaging. I'll give you an example of that. This is an example of uh, imaging the lymphatics in a patient with, uh, with lower extremity lymphedema. You know this person has lower extremity lymphedema because I don't know if you've caught it, but from the injection site, you saw a little bit of that lymph going to the, the, the back of the foot or the, the bottom of the foot. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. What we usually do is we put a Band-Aid over top of the injection site, and then sometimes we'll put um, um, uh, opaque black tape over top because uh, the, the dye is, even though it's a small amount, it, the camera's so sensitive that it will oversaturate the camera. But you see how simple um, the technique is. All our movies are sped up about three times so that you can actually see that, that movement. Now the hardest thing associated with the technology is basically making this man to injection. This is the intradermal injection. You have to get that wheel. And, we have, and you have to put it right in the intradermal space, which is a really small space. So um, this is the most difficult part of the um, technique. And in the time that we're um, giving this webinar, you know, we could probably image your lymphatics in your arms and legs. That's how simple it really is. 
our idea is to get this into the um, in, into the therapist's hands so um, you guys can uh, you know look at lymphatic function like this. This is the lymphatic function we're talking about. This is uh, the, these are the functional lymphatics in a normal pair of legs. Um, and what you'll notice is number one, these lymphatics are straight. Hopefully you can see the pumping that's going on. Um, uh, and the other thing you should note is that the, the lymphatics seem to be symmetrical. And, and that's usually the case between the arms and the legs, it's symmetrical. Everybody's lymphatic pattern is a little bit different. Um, not everybody will have this, these bundles that are wrapping around the leg in this distinctive pattern. Um, we usually do the injections in the top of the feet or the top of the hands. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to look at these lymphatic uh, vessels, their function, but we also like to see that these vessels drain to well-defined lymph node basins. And so we see all the lymph node basins in the arms and, and the legs, the inguinal lymph node, the axillary lymph nodes, the cubital orbital lymph nodes, the popliteal in the, in the, in the knee. So we, we make certain that we can see all those lymph nodes because that basically says that we're delivering to the lymphatic watershed. Now we do not see uh, deep into the torso, so we can't see that deep central uh, um, uh, the thoracic duct. Um, we do see um, the lymph nodes in neck, as you'll see a little bit later on. Um, in children, we can see uh, uh, somewhat of the torso, but in adults, we can't. So it's sufficient enough to be able to look at lymphatic disorders. Um, I like to show this image. This is a really old image, um, and and this is in the uh, injection in the heel of a person. I think this person is 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 normal. I, have, I can't remember quite certain, but it looks normal. Uh, what we actually see is that. Um, uh, a deep lymphatic vessel there. Um, the deeper that we see, the dimmer the endosinine green, we can see that that's a vessel because we've got that lymphatic motion that's going on. The reason why it's dimmer is because as that light propagates back through the surface, it's attenuating, there's absorption that occurs, and also there's a lot of scattering, so that may, tends to make that, those lymphatic vessels uh, look a little bit broader. Um, nonetheless, what we can do is we can actually monitor the lymphatic function of these lymphangions. Um, and what we do is we basically position ourselves uh, at some location and we watch the intensity of the fluorescence from the endosinine green that increases, decreases at that lymphangion, empties, um, and then we see it filling up again and then emptying again. And this frequency is regular. Uh, I should say that this frequency is not related to the breathing rate or the heart rate. And these frequencies are basically um, when the patient is still, so it's not due to muscle motion. So unlike the venous side, where there is no active contraction of the, of the venous vessels, the lymphatics basically pump. Really interesting um, idea. There are times when the lymphatics don't pump. It's when there's a, pro, a, 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 a cytokine storm or pro-inflammatory um, conditions that, that occur. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, uh, in a few moments. Um, you know, most of you are um, lymphatic therapists, so I don't really need to describe the lymphatic watershed. You know, it turns out that um, as we evolved and moved from the oceans, um, it turns out that, you know, we encountered a lot of antigens or foreign materials on land. And as a result, we evolved from our lymphatic system becoming one of a circulatory system to one that had watersheds. And the reason why we did that is that way we can encounter a lot of antigens without compromising or overwhelming our immune system. So the lymphatic watershed's really, really important for immune surveillance and maintaining um, immunity. Um, so let me give you an, a, a flow through of what, what the, how the lymphatics are involved in immunity. Let's take a, a virus, a bacteria, um, and these virus and bac bacteria, um, you know, they're recognized by the body as being foreign. Um, we also have cell death, like for in cancer, uh, you know, cancer rate and, and cancer treatment, the radiation treatment kills cells, kills cancer cells and normal cells. And, and when, when cells die, um, you know, the immune system recognizes um, cell debris as like foreign. So it'll set up an immune response also. So whether it's a virus or bacteria or it's cell death, what happens is, is that the dendritic cells or these immune cells, the immune cells of the innate system, they basically become active, activated. Cytokines are produced, they phagocytose, um, the foreign material of, of the question. And then they mature and present antigens. 
those antigens are then basically uh, transported by this immune cell through the collecting and conducting vessels so that it reaches the regional lymph node basin. That, that antigen presenting cell um, then basically transits to the center of the lymph node, the germinal center, where it will educate these naive T cells and some B cells, as a matter of fact, but we'll just focus on the T cells for now. These, when, when that dendritic cell reaches out and educates about the, the antigen to attack, that T cell becomes activated, then it proliferates, and that's kind of the reason why when you have the flu, you know, your lymph nodes are kind of enlarged and, and, and firm, it's because of this, these proliferating cells. After those T cells are proliferating, they then leave the efferent lymphatics and they basically empty into the blood vasculature. Once in the blood vasculature, they hone out to where the infection is and they cause systemic immunity. So even though the immune system is set up regionally in a lymphatic watershed, it causes systemic immunity because of the way that the lymphatics enter into the empty into the uh, blood vasculature. Now, what's kind of interesting is, is this innate immune response, you know, if you, it will not be resolved because those activated um, uh, uh, dendritic cells, those activated dendritic cells are not able to get into the lymphatics because if we have disruption of lymphatics, we have this raging innate response and we can't resolve it because those, those cells are trapped there. In addition, um, we can't set up systemic immunity because after all, those cells that are presenting the antigen aren't available to go to the, the lymph nodes to, to educate the T cells and the B cells that's necessary for, for, for immunity. So, um, so think about that whenever you're talking, when you're trying to restore lymphatic function, because really, really what you're doing is you're restoring the immunity. And that's, that's really super important. Um, so I'm going to talk first about breast cancer-related lymphedema. And um, on your screen here, as you see a normal arm, okay, you'll see uh, functioning uh, lymphatics. Uh, that's lymph is being propelled to the axillary, to the axillary lymph nodes. And these are uh, images that are obtained by injections at the wrists and perhaps at the top of the hand. You don't need very much to do that. And this will go on for about four hours or more. Uh, we haven't really figured out how long we can do the, the imaging. Um, in contrast to that, this is the arm of um, a breast cancer-related lymphedema subject. It's an early breast cancer-related lymphedema subject. I, I think the movie, let me make sure I get the movie going. Yep, it's going. Um, but there's no motion, as you see. We see that there's lymphangiogenesis. This is this process of new lymphatics forming. They're usually not straight. They're kind of tortuous. In addition, you see this really fine, lacy uh, vasculature. These are those initial lymphatics, okay? And this is what we term um, dermal backflow. And we, we, we see this as a, as a characteristic of lymphatic function, of breast cancer lymphedema, other lymphedemas, and as we'll describe a little bit later on, of other uh, chronic conditions of lymphatic dis, uh, dysfunction. So what we think is happening in this dermal backflow is is, is that these lymphangions are basically weakening. So, you know, these lymphangions, when they pump, that they, they suck um, fluid or lymph from, from the initial lymphatics and they propel lymph forward. And if, that, if that, that pump is weak, then we're not creating enough pressure to force uh, uh, fluid up to the draining lymph node basins. And so what will happen is like, we'll make an injection in the wrist and we'll see that instead of going all the way up to the axillary, it'll come backwards and backwards and feed back into these initial lymphatics. That is our first sign of lymphatic uh, uh, dysfunction. And, and we usually see that in, even in um, asymptomatic uh, uh, people, but we never see these in uh, normal healthy uh, uh, persons. Um, here's a poll question. Um, so I've given you a little bit of information about um, uh, uh, the lymphatics and how, how we how, how they work and what their normal anatomy is. Which subject do you think has normal lymphatics in the arm? And I'll walk through each of these. Um, is it A, B, C, or D? And while you're voting, let me just um, point out to you is that um, this lymphangiogenesis that we get, we think that this lymphangiogenesis is kind of like the plasticity of the lymphatics that are growing in a way to remove that excess fluid and those immune cells. So it's kind of like an activated state. These lymphatics are very plastic, so they reorganize all the time. 
So I guess we're we're um, looking at the uh, yeah. There, you guys are pretty much on the on on the uh, mark. Um, are we done? Let me share the results with you. Uh, do we share them here? Sorry, did them? Yes, we did. Um, so it looks like um, uh, uh, some of you have thought that D was um, uh, uh, was normal. Actually, that's it's part right. There's this normal lymphatic bundle that's draining to the axilla. This is actually a person that had um, carpal tunnel syndrome um, uh, surgery. And he developed a little bit of edema in the back of his arm. And what you see is this lymphangiogenesis, these plastic vessels being formed and being uh, taking that, 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 that fluid and that immune cells and delivering it to the, to the normal bundle. So this isn't quite normal, um, uh, but there is some edema that's back here. So that's, that's an unusual uh, phenotype. Um, the Subject A is basically a person or a woman that has inflammatory breast uh, cancer. Inflammatory breast cancer is basically breast cancer of the lymphatics. Um, so, so inflammatory breast cancer oftentimes plugs up the lymphatics and you get the pewed orange on the breast as a function. Uh, so this is before any sort of treatment, but obviously this is a, a cancer patient that, that has impaired lymphatics probably because the lymphatics are uh, obstructed by metastasis, by these uh, metastasizing inflammatory breast cells. B is the correct answer. Um, and the hint was, you know, in the beginning slide, uh, we actually showed this with the movie. And, you know, and if you recall, there was beautiful motion. These are straight lymphatic vessels. C is actually a, 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 an image um, in one of our publications. You can go back and see the movie of it. Um, this is an early breast cancer um, uh, lymphedema, uh, I think it's stage one, uh, and she actually has these functional vessels, and the therapist is actually trying to push the fluid into these major, bun these major um, lymphatic vessels and, and, and coaxing them to actually, um, actually pump. Here's another one, another poll question for you. Um, and uh, so here's a breast cancer-related lymphedema and quote-unquote normal. Uh, subjects or, or subjects that don't have um, uh, lymphedema. And um, here's the question, which subject do you think does not have a lymphatic dysfunction? So think about this is remember lymph always moves distal to proximal because it's all, all, only, you know, it's unidirectional. And um, oftentimes what we see is that um, in cases of subclinical lymphedema, a patient with, without any um, uh, increase of, um, of arm volume, for example, in, in terms of breast cancer, you know, um, we'll, we'll see patients that present, they'll say, oh, I feel a heaviness here or there. And, and what we actually do is we find that those patients, when we do the lymphatic imaging, we find dermal backflow at that at those locations where the patient says, I, I, I feel a little um, a heaviness. And I'm gonna share the results here. And those of you that said um, B is normal, is correct. A is that one, uh, uh, it was actually a, a, a male uh, patient or subject of ours who had um, uh, breast cancer. And he, had, he was very fastidious. His, his um, right arm was actually smaller than his left arm, but he was convinced he had lymphedema because of this heaviness, and there was the dermal backflow. Um, this, is a, this is the normal patient, you know, you know, no matter where, the injection sites are all kind of different, but you, can, you don't really need to inject in the same place because wherever you inject them, you get these straight vessels, okay, and, they, and there's no movie on here, um, but if there were, they would see some propulsion. That's what normal is. This is an advanced breast cancer patient who um, basically said she had sweaty palms. Turns out that when we injected on the top of her hand, we actually saw lymph flowing proximal to distal. So it was going the wrong direction and it was actually pumping in the wrong direction. And when she turned her palm over, we saw that she, wasn't, had, she didn't have sweaty palms. She actually had palms that were basically, you know, there were just these lymph coming out as fluorescent. Uh, lymph um, that came out of her palm. This is an in interesting subject. This is um, this is actually normal, but actually someone who had like an autoimmune, an RA symptom. And we do know um, from animal studies and, 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 and some limited patient studies that people that have autoimmune disorders basically have um, impaired lymphatic function. And indeed in RA, we basically have this breakdown 
of, of bone, the, 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 you know, the osteolytic activity in the joints. And that's because the immune cells are not moving. They're not being picked up from the lymphatics. And this is a patient that injection at the wrist, we see that we have um, low towards the distal and dermal backflow. So dermal backflow isn't just an indication of, um, uh, of cancer-related lymphedema, but can be a, uh, an indication of others. Interestingly enough, those of you that are uh, lymphedema therapists, you know, when I, I talk to uh, some of you, you guys tell me that your, your lymphedema patients also often have a comorbidity of rheumatoid arthritis. It makes sense because both are uh, associated with lymphatics. So here's another question. Um, it kind of follows in to what we just talked about. Which foot has lymphatic dysfunction? You know, it turns out that the feet and hands are really great places to do injections just off the top of the dorsal foot or top of the dorsal hands like we've done here. And, and, and you know, there's a lot of lymphatic vessels there. And it, it's really a, a very beautiful sight to see. Um, and I see you guys um, uh, are voting. It looks like you guys are smart. I'm sharing the results. And of course, whenever you have any of that lymphatic flow that goes to the bottom of the foot or the, or the, in the, in the palm of the hand, um, you know, that's, you know, that's bad. And so this is a, this is a, a, a person that we saw at the uh, injection at the top of the foot. We saw that, you know, the lymph, ICG laden lymph went to the bottom of the foot. Um, we always look, we ask people to look at their hands and the bottom of their feet, because that tells us something if, you know, they have a disorder, um, if they have lymphatic dysfunction. So that's something that we see. Um, we don't see it commonly, um, but, it, but it's not, it's not rare. Um, so in summary uh, of this section, you know, what we see, it, what we appear to see is that, you know, lymphatics change from, from straight and normal to dermal backflow as we have this onset of, of cancer-related lymphedema. We'll see lymphangiogenesis, more lymphangiogenesis and more backflow. And in the late stages where a lot of therapists get to see the patients for the first time, we have this basis where we have, you know, we just have a lot of extra vascular lymph. So we do an injection of endocytin green, it comes out the initial lymphatics and, and the chore is to actually move that, you know, that toxic lymph, uh, lymph um, out of these tissues. Because when you're moving that, that lymph out, you're also moving out the waste products and the, and the immune cells and, and the cytokines that they actually produce. Um, so, so, you know, this is some of our earlier work um, where, um, this extravascular lymph was actually moved from these tactile devices um, in, in breast cancer uh, survivors. And what you see here at the top, this is, um, uh, bef you know, we did the injection before we put the, the garment on. And, and so you'll see that there's some, some movement of the lymph all, only up to the elbow. But then what we did is we put the tactile device on, did a treatment for 30 minutes, removed the device, and then looked to see. And we see that the, that, that these pneumatic compression devices, we also see this with manual lymphatic drainage, is that we're actually moving this lymph um, uh, distal to proximal, which has got to be good because you're removing all that toxic lymph, the waste products, and moving it towards a functional lymphatic base. And here's another example of it. Before um, an injection will go, not quite get up to the, the, the axle, we won't see the lymph nodes um, involved, but then after the tactile device, you see a lot more, um, dermal backflow coverage because we're moving that, that extravascular lymph um, out of the, of the area. This is a real dramatic area where an injection in the wrist of a breast cancer uh, lymphedema patient, she's got the arm over her head like this. And, and then after the treatment, you'll see that she's got this kind of like starry night. It's all extravascular um, uh, lymph. And again, we're just moving it uh, proximal, moving it out of the impacted uh, tissues. Um, I want to talk about head and neck cancer, and um, before I talk about head and neck cancer, head and neck cancer lymphedema, before I talk about it, I have to talk about what's normal um, in normal healthy adults. So we actually image um, the lymphatics in, in, in head and neck cancer patients and in normal patients. You'll do two injections before and after the ear and at the mandible, and what you see is you see this beautiful lymphatic drainage to the sub, subcurricular uh, lymph nodes. In addition, you know, you have um, external lymphatics, but you also have internal lymphatics. And um, this is really interesting. What we do is we do injection in the palatine tossel into the mucosal um, lymphatics. 
and, and this drains to the biggest lymph node in your body, which is the parotid um, lymph node. And this is the lymph node chain that um, head and neck surgeons actually dissect when you have lymph node dissection. Um, you see that we can actually see that. That's probably about three to four centimeters deep. So we can actually see um, this drainage um, uh, through this lymph, uh, this lymph node chain. Um, this is kind of an important lymph node chain because, you know, I, I don't know if you, some of you may know that this concept of G lymphatics that drain the brains is, 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 is really a, a current topic. We know that the, cent the cerebral spinal fluid um, is produced by the ventricles of the brain, and we produce about 600 cc's per day. So this is, this is a, you know, we're in the skull, okay, we're producing all this fluid, 600 cc's, well, where does it go? And we've always thought that uh, with the old pathology, we always thought that it was reabsorbed by the venous uh, arachnoid granulations. And we now know that that's not the case. And in fact, the 600 cc, all, all, all it, the conduit for CSF is through this lymph node chain that we just imaged. Um, so when surgeons take this lymph node chain, we're, we're basically just we're disturbing um, the flow of lymph and the flow of CSF out into the body. And these lymph nodes um, are the place for the adaptive um, immune response to things that happen in the brain. So this is really quite important. Um, and we, when we have these patients with um, neck dissection, of course we take the, 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 we take the lymph nodes out and then we irradiate so that we can kill the cancer, but we also cause a lot of innate immune response because there's this cell debris. And what we find in patients that have neck, neck node, lymph node uh, dissection in the neck, as well as radiation, we find they always have dermal um, backflow. So this is a patient, this is a, uh, after surgery, and right, you know, right in the beginning stages of radiotherapy, and you'll see there's some lymphatics. There's, these people did not have um, internal lymphatic flow when we injected in the back of the mouth, which may be expected because they had lymph node dissection. Um, but then you'll see that there's a dermal backflow, dermal backflow and you know this is this is way out um like 60 70 80 weeks afterwards we have der dermal backflow this dermal backflow persists and in of all all of our patients that had um neck dissection and radiation they all had dermal backflow now did they have um did they have uh, edema well it's hard to tell you know you can't just look at a contralateral head and assess that there's an increase in swelling um, did they have fibrosis? Yeah, they probably had fibrosis, but this was not necessarily identified as lymphedema um, it, because it's not a swelling. It doesn't look like breast cancer lymphedema or lower extremity lymphedema. Um, the question is, is can you catch this early and revert this? If, is, is that possible? So um, uh, Tactile actually funded this study, and this was really an interesting study. This is, a, this is one of our first patients in the study that's published uh, here, and you can go back and, and look at it. It's a fascinating um, uh, example. This is a gentleman who had no, no lymph node dissection, but had radiation. And um, so, so, he, so he did have metastatic cancer. Um, he had a primary uh, 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 tumor that was removed, and then radiation. And these are the injection sites. And what you see is this really nasty um, dermal backflow. In fact, it goes up, you know, it goes, <laughs> it goes the wrong direction. And, and you see a little bit of the lymph node. Remember, we didn't have lymph node dissection. So you see a little bit of the drainage lymph node. So here he is, four weeks post um, radiation and treatment. And so the question is, is that four weeks post radiation treatment, tell me what you think about this. Would you consider this dermal backflow and this impaired uh, lymphatic drainage without any overt swelling? So there's no swelling. There doesn't look any to be any um, drainages. Is this something that you would be concerned about? Is this just a normal reaction associated with radiation? I should tell you that not everybody had this, okay? But tell me what you think. And I see you guys are all voting. Um, some of you think it's normal, no need for concern. And, you know, that may be the case. Uh, some may think it's a predictor of uh, cancer-acquired lymphedema or a definitive sign of uh, cancer-acquired lymphedema. Um, it's hard to tell what that is, but let me share with you the opinion. You guys are finished. Let me share the results. Okay, there are the results. Um, it looks like um, it's about tie between a predictor or a definitive sign. 
I think more studies need to be done. But when you, if you saw someone with lymph flow like that, that's not physiologic, that's not normal function, when you try to, to, to change it, well, what we did is we actually um, used um, uh, manual lymphatic drainage. And, and, and in this case, we used the um, uh, uh, FlexiTouch uh, head and neck device. And we did this, this was easy for us to do because what we did is, we saw this gentleman, he had dermal backflow. We basically put the device on um, and this device basically massages the receiving lymph node basins and then attempts with, with the advanced pneumatic compression chambers to push the lymph um, towards those receiving basins. And um, what you see is that, you know, right after the therapy, we see that the, the dermal backflow increased just like in the breast cancer patients. And, and, you know, there was a little bit of an increase in that lymph node, but at least he's still a dermal backflow. But after, for a week, or I'm sorry, we, we sent him home with this device and he had to use it for, for two weeks, 30 minutes a day, that's all. And this is the result that we got, which was really stunning. Remember, we said that dermal backflow persists. Here's this gentleman after, after two weeks of this, uh, of this treatment with the FlexiTouch device, um, we saw that you know, we didn't have any more dermal backflow. Look at the lymph node, how bright it is. That's, so we're, we're restoring lymphatic function. Now, did we avert um, lymphedema in this patient? Do you think that we did this? In your opinion, with the data presented, you know, do you think we could potentially prevent the onset of head and neck uh, cancer lymphedema? The other question you might see, you know, we think about lymphedema as being incurable, and maybe very well so when it's at the late stages um, where, where we have extravascular lymph flow. It may be incurable, but is it? Do you think there's a possibility that we might be able to cure it early if we caught it early? You guys are questioning, or you guys are answering the opinion poll right here, and I'll share that with you in a moment. But maybe if maybe if we had a different metric for measuring lymphedema instead of this overt measurement of this late measurement of um, of swelling and fibrosis, maybe we may be maybe we could intercede earlier and, and cure lymphedema or prevent lymphedema. So let me show you the results. Yeah, I, I, I like the answers. <laughs> yeah. I think it's not certain yet, but man, it possibly could be the case that we're just, we're just not seeing the early stages of, of this condition that we could um, implement the most effective uh, treatments. Um, and I think that the data suggests that more data is needed. I'm going to end today with a discussion of peripheral vascular disease. I'm running a little bit late, so let me just speed through this a little bit. You know, peripheral vascular disease um, is going to hit us all. We're the aging population, uh, and, you know, gravity works against us. And, you know, we, we, we basically have the early onset of, of vascular diseases, C1, C2, where we have the spider veins and the varicose veins. Without any, the legs don't hurt. And these are treated cosmetically, but whenever we have advancing um, disease, which has to go through all these stages, um, basically this is a, a medical condition because we're having impaired uh, blood flow to the heart. And, and you'll go through C2, that's varicose veins with symptoms. Um, then you'll have swelling, which boy, there's, there's a harbinger, there's maybe lymphatics involved, uh, skin damage, and, and then eventually we'll get to a venous ulcer which could be healed, but frequently, once they heal, they reoccur, we get stuck in this vicious cycle. It's very um, uh, hard to heal these and, and keep these, uh, these vessels away. Remember, I told you that the initial lymphatics line, every organ with a blood vessel is a, a organ itself. In the adventitia of a blood vessel, we have these initial uh, lymphatics. And these initial lymphatics are to take immune cells, waste products, and with a functioning pump, it's supposed to remove them and take them to the blood vasculature for processing. Well, it turns out that in, in, in vascular wounds, this is a gentleman that had a mixed arterial venous disease. He had this dermal backflow. And remember I told you that the lymphatics are supposed to be symmetrical. Notice that he's got more lymphatics on his, his, his disease leg wing in C6 as an active ulcer. And we think that that's because the lymphatics are plastic. We're, with the lymphatics are working really hard to remove all that you know, dying immune cells, the, the cell debris that's associated with the vascular wound. And um, if I take a blow up of the lymphatics in this area, let's see if I can do this. Now remember that lymph is supposed to move distal to proximal. Let's see if you can see that. 
Did you see like it goes backwards? It's like almost like a lymphatic reflux. So this is, these are lymphatics, they're pumping, they're trying really hard to move up. But what happens I think is that there's a pro-inflammatory um, response and these lymphatics are kind of like dilated. And when they try to pump, you know, it's not very effective. And so we get this dermal backflow. And in order for these, these, these wounds to heal, we need to actually remove this toxic material remove the, the, the cell debris, re, re, remove those, those immune cells and the cytokines that they produce. In fact, if we look at people with um, ulcers, venous ulcers, you know what we see in all of these pa patients, we see that they have this ICG pulling at the site of an ulcer, at, at the contralateral site of what will, will be an ulcer, and we don't see any lymphatic pumping. Suggesting that even, you know, perhaps these ulcers are created because this these lymph pumps don't work, and we've got this pulling because of gravity at the ankles, and this toxic fluid basically may be responsible for the, for the ulcer formation in the first place. And you would think that if you move that lymph, you're gonna hasten the, the, the healing of these ulcers. And in fact, you know, it doesn't take a lot of, it makes sense, it's very logical that if you basically are moving lymph, as you do with this flexing touch device, we see that before the treatment and after the treatment, we're actually removing this ICG-laden lymph out from the, from, from the ulcer area. And again, that's going to hasten the healing of, of those ulcers. And here you see it again here, that, that just this idea of moving um, the, this, this fluid like that, you know, and returning all those waste products to the blood vasculature, you're improving um, the healing uh, time. It, I should point out that even in C4 disease, before an ulcer, we have lymphatic um, dysfunction. There's the injection site and, and dermal backflow. Now, I have to ask you this. Um, you know, I'm going to show you this next image. And, and you know, I, you already know that C is normal. That's the normal the lympho uh, on the inside of the leg. One of these uh, patients is a C3 patient. This may be, an, uh, you know, uh, an unfair question, but I wonder if you can Take a crack at it. Which patient do you think has an arterial disease, a Fontaine to be uh, arterial disease? While you're um, while you're uh, answering that, um, giving us your opinion, turns out that we know that in atherosclerosis, for example, the atherosclerotic plaque is formed in the adventitia, in the intima, where there's immune cells that are that are built up. And those initial lymphatics are supposed to draw those out, take those immune cells and those and the waste products and take it away from the blood vessel wall. And so it wouldn't be so surprising if we had um, impaired lymphatics in arterial disease. Um, which patient do you guys think has arterial disease? You guys said A, that most of you said that. That's correct. Um, it is, it is A. Um, so here we see um, a, this dermal backflow and there's no motion in these. In the C3 patients, we actually see um, like a corkscrew, like a varicose lymphatic. And we've seen this in other studies um, where we use the lymphangiography with the CT contrast, which is really difficult to do. But, but um, we, think that, um, we think that in early venous disease, we have lymphatic insufficiency to begin with. Now I'm gonna go really quick here. Here's a poll question. Does this patient have venous or lymphatic disease? And if you guys can put up the polling question and while you vote, let me tell you a little bit about it. You know, she's got right leg edema, uh, but on a venogram, she had um, compression of the left iliac vein, suggesting that, you know, she, she may have had venous hypertension in the left leg, but there was a lot of contralaterals and maybe it impacted the right leg. Um, so she developed this suddenly when she went through puberty. Turned out that um, she was treated for venous disease and a stent was placed in her left leg. So you guys, let's see, you guys are, you, most of you think that it's, um, share the results, most of you think that it's lymphatic disease. Some of you think it's venous disease. I think both of you are right. You know, we don't, we know that the, 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 the venogram showed that there, there seemed to be an obstruction. It wasn't a big obstruction. But you know, if the venogram was the result, we would have probably had swelling in the, in the left, not the right leg. Um, when we actually do the uh, imaging, the nerfly imaging, this is her, uh, her, her right leg and this is her left leg. And you'll see a lot of dermal backflow. But made us so excited that if you see her leg here, you see this deep lymphatic vessel that's pumping. 
If we can only improve that angiom pump, perhaps we can get that pressure so that it goes all the way up to the inguinal lymph nodes and we can spare this dermal backflow and may, may, maybe reduce the, the edema. So we actually, um, this is a patient that we actually um, uh, put on a, 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 a FlexiTouch uh, device. So I'm gonna stop here and just point out that these lymphatics are essential for immune health. And most of our chronic condition in our aging population is associated in some way or another with lymphatic dysfunction. And in fact, um, many of you may know that you know, venous disease um, uh, is accompanied by comorbidity of, uh, of RA. The same thing occurs with uh, lymphedema. Many of the therapists tell me, oh yeah, my, my, some of my subjects, some of my patients actually have RA disease. Um, I've also highlighted a little bit, you might guess that, you know, A beta, um, you know, there's CSF outflow, goes through the lymphatics, and if you have, if you have congestion in the lymphatics, perhaps you have impaired CSF outflow. That's impairment of your waste products being uh, drained from your brain, like A beta. Uh, A beta protein is, is produced ubiquitously, and um, if it's not cleared, it forms plaques. So, so there's all sorts of, um, new ideas and paradigm shifting um, uh, experiments that are being done on the rule of the lymphatics um, in these and, and several other um, uh, disorders. I went a little bit over, I apologize for that. I might want to be respectful of your time. It's been a pleasure uh, speaking with you. Um, I wish we had a little bit more of the in-person um, interaction, but I understand there's questions and answers that I could entertain if there's enough time. Sure can. Yes, thank you, Dr. Savick, for sharing such beneficial education and sharing your research with us. And we will transition to our Q&A time, and uh, we will take as many questions as we have in the next few minutes and maximize. And as a reminder, you all can still continue to submit questions through the Q&A icon. So let's kick off your question. Uh, one of our guests asks, how often are otolaryngologists doing these exams? Are sometimes head and neck patients don't visually present? Yeah, it's very interesting. I, I, I don't, I, I can't say that I know the answer to that. I do know that our collaborator is uh, Ron Carney and uh, we approached him and he basically said, my patients don't get head and neck cancer lymphedema. And what he meant is that big swollen face. And after we showed him all his results, he's like, oh my gosh, every person, you know, you know, it, it is, 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 has it. It, it, when you define it as this, this lymphatic dysfunction. I don't know what um, the head and neck docs are actually doing. I think that there's a lot more attention to it. This is in the head and neck societies. I know that we've been presenting our work there and I know the clinicians are adopting this. So um, I think it's an important area um, uh, that they need to be concerned about because cancer survivorship is going to be uh, impaired if you've got fibrosis and you can't swallow or you can't breathe or you can't turn your neck. Yes, fantastic. To follow up on the head and neck question, we have one more. In the head and neck example, it appeared that the subject had lymphedema already as seen in his head and neck and some mental area. Was that yeah. the case? Yeah. Yeah, it, it's, it's really hard because, you know, when you have, um, I, I don't know if they were talking about the, um, the, uh, uh, subject with a head and neck can with a lymph node dissection or um, the radiation. Oftentimes we'll see this, this uh, accumulation of fat or lymph or whatever we, it is. And yeah, you'll see some of that. And, and that itself may, is probably another um, indication of uh, lymphatic abnormalities. Fantastic. Uh, we have a question moving more to the Vasco area. Um, she says, I take care of varicose veins. Many times I see lymphedema. When do you suggest referral for tactile? You know, I'm not an MD, so I can't say. But, you know, think about this. If you have edema, um, that means the lymphatics are not keeping up. You know, whether they're defective or they just can't keep up, clearly we need some help. Um, so I guess my, my point is, is, in, in, in C4, where you have edema, I would definitely use it. And, you know, in C3, where there's no indication of edema, I would still definitely use it. But, but um, because after all, we see that there is dermal backflow. So edema is a late sign. Um, we think that, you know, before there's edema, there's fluid accumulations, there's, there's a loss of that function. 
and that's going to revert back into dermal flow first, okay, and then eventually get to edema. Good insight. Uh, great question here. Can patients at any age where lymphatic dysfunction is evident, can they generate new lymphatics with angiogenesis that actually can be functional? Yeah, you know, with that, so but that's a really great question. Um, uh, it's, it's really interesting. Our body um, uh, basically repairs itself. It's something called, you know, we, we even form, after we remove lymph nodes, we form new lymph nodes. We form ectopic lymph nodes. Whenever the body wants to have a, a restore its own lymphatic watershed, it builds its own lymphatics and, and, and we'll have ectopic lymph nodes that are being formed. We image that several times. But let me point out one thing. Um, you know, it's a pump and pipe pro problem. If your lymphangiomes are the are the are the pump, okay, and you have too many vessels, okay, your pump is going to have to work harder. So, so I think that there's it's great to have more lymph vessels, but I think there's going to be a limit because the more lymph vessels that you have, you're going to have to have greater lymph pumping to basically get fluid through those vessels. So there's a happy medium. Yes. Um, this is a really good question. Excellent presentation, first of all. Um, could you please comment on what you said earlier about the relationship between the sympathetic nervous system and lymphatic flow? <laughs> we, we don't know. I have to be very honest with you. We don't know. We know that there's innervation in those, in those lymphangions, okay? And, um, you know, this is antidotal that, you know, um, in, in autism, uh, it, it actually, I was told by, um, uh, the Aut Autism Society, the founder of the Autism Society, that, that, that children with a shank three mutation in autism basically have lower extremity lymphedema. And, and you know, here's this, the shank three that's associated with the autonomic nervous system, this mutation. And, and um, we don't really quite know at this point in time what causes those, those lymph vessels to pump. And in fact, it's interesting, um, and this was actually done in a lymphedema in, in a tactile study. Um, when you massage uh, unidirectional breast cancer lymphedema patients on one arm, we would image the other arm, and the lymph pumping would start with increase in both arms. We don't know. This, we're really early in, in, in this research, and, and we've actually only started as a community start to look at the lymphatic function. Yeah, good insight. Um, I guess ask, can I refer lymphedema, lymphedema patients to you for nearby testing and research? <laughs> what I really want to do is get the imaging device to you guys so that you guys can do it. Um, and that's what we're really, our focus is really to get that technology out to you. I'm a PhD, a chemical engineer by training. I don't know enough. I don't know as much as you guys do to, to basically um, understand um, what you would see by nerve imaging. So we're, we're working very hard to get this out um, and, and get this technology so that you guys can uh, make the major contributions uh, to lymphatic research. Yeah, definitely a good teamwork approach. Last question. What is the difference between lymphocentigraphy and near-infrared fluorescence imaging? Good question. Lymphocentigraphy is um, basically when people inject a radiocolloid, so it's radioactive, and it's an acidic solution. And if you're gonna do a lymphocentigraphy of the hands or feet, what you do is you, you inject it in the webs of the toes or the, or the fingers. It's very painful. And it's a colloid, so it's a particle. And what you do is you, it's radioactive. So after you do this procedure of injection, um, then what you do is you go to the, uh, the, the nuclear imaging suite and you wait for a while. And basically you sit under a camera and that radiocolloid, when that colloid radionuclide decays, it gives a single photon. And so you sit under the camera for something like 20 minutes or so, and what you end up getting is a very grainy image. Um, in the United States, we usually don't use lymphocytography for diagnosis of lymphedema because by the time you see impaired um, lymph drainage from that injection site, you already know because you can see the, the swelling. Um, you don't get to see the, the vessels, the individual vessels. You, basically, what they usually measure is they measure the amount of time for the radiocolloid to show up in the lymph node. So you, sometimes they'll see a vessel or so, or sometimes they'll see a lot of um, colloid, and they'll assume that that's associated with thermal backflow. But again, it's not used as, as frequent. It's expensive, and it takes an afternoon or a morning in, in, in the time that we gave this presentation. We, we 
probably could have done a couple of the um, participants. <laughs> we could have managed the participants. <laughs>